a problem worthy of attack proves its worth by fighting back. And that's what Fermat's last theorem was doing. It was fighting back. So we're talking about Fermat's last theorem. And I suppose the place to start is with Fermat, Pierre de Fermat, who was a 17th century mathematician living and working in, in France, not working as, as a mathematician, but working as a judge. And every evening he'd go home and maths was his hobby. One evening he, he, he was looking at an equation um, which looks a bit like Pythagoras' equation, which I suppose is x to squared plus y squared equals z squared. Uh, and he was looking for whole number solutions to that equation. And there are lots, you know, there's three squared plus four squared, five squared. So that's a whole number solution to x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Now, Fermat asked himself the question, what about if I change this equation? So instead of it being x squared, what about if it's x cubed or x to the fourth power or y to the fourth power? Are there solutions to that equation? So in general, we're talking about x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, where n is bigger than 2. Does that equation have any whole number solutions? He thought about it for a while, and he couldn't find any whole number solutions. And then he went one step further. Not only could he not find any whole number solutions, he believed he'd found an argument. He believed he'd found a proof that showed without any doubt whatsoever, there were no whole number solutions. So this is kind of weird because we have one equation, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, that has not just one solution, it actually has an infinite number of solutions. And then you have an infinite number of equations, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth, an infinite number of equations which apparently have no solutions. And Fermat discovered this proof. And he wrote in the margin of a book he was reading that evening called The Arithmetica by Diophantus. And he wrote in the margin of his book, he wrote, I have a truly marvelous proof, which this margin is too narrow to contain. Hank marginis exiguatus non caparat in Latin. In other words, I know how to prove that this equation has no solutions, but I don't have the space to write it down. And then he drops dead. It very much was a, a secret proof, which he never wrote down. And then after his death, his son, um, Samuel Clement, I think, rediscovered this book, which had this marginal note. I have a truly marvelous proof, a demonstratium mirabilum. Um, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And in fact, the book is full of these little annoying notes. I can prove this, but I've got to go and feed the cat. I can prove this, but I've got to go and wash my hair. Um, so Fermat was quite annoying in this respect. So his son published a new version of the book, The Arithmetica by Diophantus, but with all of Fermat's little notes printed in the text. And people would look at these notes and they would say, well, Fermat says he can prove this. Let's try it. And one by one, people rediscovered the missing proofs. And in every case where Fermat, where Fermat said, I have a proof, he was right, there was a proof. Except in this one example here. Fermat's last theorem is called Fermat's last theorem because it was the last one that anybody could actually find the proof for. And of course, because it's the last one that anyone can prove, it's the most precious one, it's the one that's most desirable. And the more that people try, the more they fail, the more wonderful it becomes. Um, and this goes on for decades, it goes on for centuries, right through to the 20th century, where people are desperate to rediscover what Fermat's proof might have been. Is it widely held that he had done it, or had he disclaimed? Like, was he telling the truth? I, I think by the time we get to the 20th century, it's quite clear that this is an incredibly complex problem. It, it's simple to jot down in a few scribbles what the, what the question is. It's easy to describe the problem. The proof is clearly uh, profound and, and probably beyond Fermat's reach, to be honest. Some people say Fermat was just fooling around. It was just a trick that he, he left something in his book that he knew would trouble subsequent generations. I think that's least likely. Some people say that he did have a genuine proof and it's beautiful and it's elegant and it's 17th century and, and we could kind of rediscover that proof, but we're just not quite clever enough. I think that's possible, but I, unlikely. I think the most likely explanation is that Fermat thought he had a proof. Because he was working on his own, and because he didn't show this proof to anybody else, nobody could tell him, oh, there's a mistake there. You know, line three has got, has got something wrong with it. And, and, and that's very likely because we know that subsequent generations of mathematicians thought they'd found a proof. And then they'd publish it, and people would tear it apart, and they'd find the error. So what we're looking for 
is not Fermat's proof, which was probably flawed, but we're looking for some kind of proof to see whether Fermat was right uh, all along. It has a happy ending, and it starts with a 10-year-old child, uh, a chap called Andrew Wiles, who was reading a book one day. He, he's, he was growing up in Cambridge. He went to the library. He got a book called The Last Problem by E.T. Bell. And the book is all about Fermat's last theorem. And, and little Andrew Wiles, age 10, decided that he was going to rediscover the missing proof. Uh, because a bright 10-year-old can understand the problem. A bright 10-year-old doesn't realise what they're letting themselves in for, but, but that's another story. And he tries, he talk, talks about, about his school teachers about the problem, he talks to his A-level teachers about the problem, he goes to university, he talks to his undergraduate lecturers about the problem. He does a PhD, and still this problem is obsessing him. I think he was about in his late 30s. By this time, he was a Princeton professor. There was something called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, which I kind of think we don't really want to get into it at the moment, which had been proposed in the 50s. So a conjecture is an idea that we don't know whether it's true or not, but somebody's putting it on the table. Somebody proved there was a link between these two conjectures, in as much as if you could prove most of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, you would get Fermat's last theorem for free. So somehow Fermat's last theorem is embedded in this other conjecture. And Andrew Wiles' childhood passion, his childhood obsession is reignited because he thinks now the Taniyama Shimura conjecture is worth a go. You know, he thinks he can get his teeth into that, but, but it's still a crazy thing to try and do. And so because it was such an absurd and ambitious challenge, Wiles didn't tell anybody about it. He um, worked on it in complete secrecy. He started um, not attending committee meetings. He started going to his office less and less. He started to um, focus on this problem once again. Not because it was a Taniyama Shimura conjecture, but because it would give him Fermat's last theorem for free. And for seven years, he worked in complete secrecy. And at the end of seven years, he suddenly realized that he had Taniyama Shimura. And if he had Taniyama Shimura, he had a proof of Fermat's last theorem. He went to Cambridge, he presented his proof on a blackboard, a, I think it was a three-part lecture. The world cheered, he was the front page of the New York Times, he was on CNN, he was everywhere. But the sting in the tail is that in any mathematical proof, you have to have it checked. You have to have it refereed and published. And when it went through the checking process, somebody found a mistake. Wiles assumed that he could fix it. But the more he tried to unravel this problem, the worse it became. And it became a huge embarrassment. You know, you've been lauded as the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. You're a hero figure. And now you have to admit you made a mistake. And it took a whole year. But at the end of that year, uh, Andrew Wiles, uh, working with a chap called Richard Taylor, managed to fix the proof. I think it's a bit like um, the Terminator film. I often talk about it in terms of, you know, when you, just when you think you've slain the monster, when you've killed the Terminator, he comes back to life and, and you have to fight him one last time. And, and somebody, one mathematician, I think Pete Hine once wrote, a problem worthy of attack proves its worth by fighting back. And that's what Fermat's last theorem was doing. It was fighting back, but Wiles proved that he was too good. And of, and of course, what Wiles proved is that Fermat was right this equation, x to the m plus y to the n equals z to the n, n bigger than 2, has no whole number solutions, and that's the end of the story.